Welcome. This is the presentation for my doctoral defense of my PhD work in material science and engineering at the, the University of California, San Diego. The talk is entitled, A Diagnostic Exam for the Non-Invasive Identification of the Artist's Palette of Pigments. I'd like to thank my committee members, especially my chair, Professor Jan Talbot from Material Science, Nanoengineering, and Chemical Engineering. Professor Jacopo Anese from Radiology and the Brain Observatory, Professor Jules Jaffe from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, Professor Falco Kuster from Structural Engineering, and Professor Joanna McKittrick from Material Science and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. I'd also like to thank the entities have supported me over the years as, my, as a graduate student, uh, including the Qualcomm Institute, National Geographic, Cal AT2, and the National Science Foundation, amongst others. Uh, these uh, resources have enabled me to complete my dissertation research and get my degree. I'll give a brief outline about the talk and what I'm going to cover. First is the field of conservation of cultural heritage artifacts, an introduction to the research and the objectives, then a bit of background and review of the literature. Then I'll focus on the, di di the, the design of the diagnostic exam, including the application in field scenarios and advanced tools we've developed for the implementation of the exam. And then I'll talk quickly about the evaluation of the method performance and go into conclusions and future work. I've had the opportunity to publish this research in a wide variety of venues, um, resulting in seven peer-reviewed publications over my time. And now we'll get to the field of conservation of cultural heritage artifacts. So why do we want to understand the artist's palette of pigments? And why create a diagnostic exam to identify them? First reason is preservation-based. To understand how to protect the work of art, we need to know what it's made out of, including what pigments are there. Second is authenticity, to, de take, to detect fakes or retouchings, because some pigments are characteristic of a time period or a particular artist. The last is art historical, to study the use and movement of artist materials over space, time, and genre. What is art conservation? What do we think of when we think of art conservation? Hopefully we don't think of this. This is a botched retouching from a Spanish painting um, that surfaced over, uh, the, over recent times as um, a, a complete transformation of, of what a painting with few losses into a completely disastrous work. Maybe we think of a studio inside a conservation lab or people working, retouching artists on scaffolding uh, checking out churches, or touching up objects, or putting together broken pottery. Maybe we think of cleanings, or removing varnishes. Well, these procedures are likely defined better as restoration, because they're all invasive. Instead, conservation should be preservation-based and preventive um, efforts to protect a work of art. So what do we think of when we think of a diagnostic exam? Well, we think of things that are non-invasive, perhaps an MRI or a doctor's visit, getting images taken, or taking our pulse, our, our blood pressure. And we think of conserving the, the data in a work, uh, in, in a file, like a clinical chart. So these are diagnostic exams as applied to the field of medicine. Why create a diagnostic exam? Well, it could help contribute to preventative conservation, like a checkup. It's a way to monitor the health of an artifact, and it's useful to inform further study and create comparable big data sets. Here at the Center of Interdisciplinary Science for Art, Architecture, and Archaeology, CHISA 3, nestled within the Qualcomm Institute and Cal IT2 at UC San Diego, I've been researching with two main advisors, uh, the director emeritus and founder of CHISA 3, Maurizio Serracini, who is a self-proclaimed art diagnostician and an expert in the engineering scientists, sciences, and director Falco Kuster, 
who works on visualization and structural engineering and computer science and engineering. Through the CHISA 3 mission, which is to train a new generation of interdisciplinary scholars to apply science and technology to the field of cultural heritage uh, in an interdisciplinary platform at the intersection of art and science, I've been able to complete my PhD working on a wide variety of projects. For the diagnostic exam, I chose to focus on the analysis of paintings, mainly because my advisor, Maurizio Serracini, has analyzed over 3,000 of them in diverse settings. And I also chose to focus on pigments become, because I'm a material scientist and I was interested in the non-invasive analytical characterization of pigment materials. One of the projects that CHISA 3 has undertaken is to uh, characterize the clinical chart of a work of art. Where should we put the data? What type of data is collected when we're looking to analyze a work? So just like the clinical chart in medicine, the clinical chart of a work of art will house all the data, all the information that we know about the history. So it begins with art historical research, archival doc documents, bibliographies, chronologies, uh, historical, historical books on the artist. And then uh, the other side is the scientific research how we've been able to document with imaging techniques and also chemical analysis, the work of art and its state of conservation. So back to the diagnostic exam. What do we think of when we think of a diagnostic exam? It should be quick. It should, be, should give us information that's useful. For medical imaging diagnostics, uh, they have been applied to cultural artifacts already such as magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. This is a, a, a cultural statue being, uh, going into the MRI machine. Also, X-ray CT, computer tomography, has been used to virtually unwrap scrolls without, without touching them and, and understand the writing. Also, neutron CT can see inside vases. Here's one that's more interesting when there's something actually inside. And lastly, the most well-known of medical imaging diagnostics, X-radiography. Here's an X-radiograph of the Madonna of the Goldfinch by Raphael. As you can see, there's a lot going on. First of all, the wooden panel has been split into several pieces, and it's put back together with nails appearing bright white around the border. Second of all, well, that's because there's, uh, there's been an earthquake and an almost an entire house fell on the painting, so it needed to be put together. And that happened almost soon after the artist painted it. But next, there's also been a few restoration procedures done on this painting. Now it looks bright and pretty, like this today in the museum. When we think about creating a diagnostic exam, we want to be able to achieve um, concrete goals. First is to obtain information that's material sensitive and characterizing. This will help us to make a pigment identification. The second is to obtain information that's spatial, that's visual, that shows us where are these materials distributed throughout the art. And that will also capture state of conservation and contextual information. So we want to do these two things, but we also have to make sure that it's an exam in the definition of diagnostic exam that it can be efficient, repeatable, adaptable, comparable, and standardized, that it's a reliable way to determine the artist palette, and that it's accessible so it can study a lot of paintings. Um, and we want it to be user-friendly and create meaningful data. For the diagnostic approach to analyzing works of art, we have a ma materials characterization toolbox a group of non-invasive techniques and techniques that include the analysis of microsamples. So first of all, we also have descriptive research, but taking into account that that will have already been um, undertaken and that for the, the diagnostic exam mentioned here, we want to focus on combining imaging diagnostics with materials analysis. We don't want to take samples because Taking lots of samples on work of art is usually not permitted. So for this diagnostic exam, we'll stick to just non-invasive techniques. First, a brief history of the application of scientific techniques to the study of cultural artifacts. 
At first, it was an ad hoc approach. Whenever a new technique came out, it was supplied eventually to works of art because people are curious and they want to uh, try and understand new things about uh, works of art and, and uh, what secrets they may hold inside. This included authenticity studies and eventually it resulted in, in developed labs that started to, to get more instrumentations. Then there have been more recently approaches that include strategic methodologies, multi-technique approaches, approaches that have mobile labs, and new PhD programs which combine uh, applied research and also um, fundamental new pathways to understand conservation and techniques. But the only one that put a diagnostics-based approach was Saracini's company called Editech. There are also uh, pigment libraries that um, are available so that we have sam material samples to, to study and understand. And nowadays they're characterized online. Uh, they're cataloged. And one example is the Cameo. Uh, the pigments come from the library of the, the Forbes database in the Harvard Art Museums. And they've had many types of analytical techniques uh, used to study them. For example, Raman spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence, liquid chromatography, and more. But it's not that every pigment has been studied using every technique. We still don't know a whole lot, and there's a lot of data missing. But this diagnostic exam can help to get m more data sets to analyze many pigments over a large variety of artworks uh, in situ. You don't need a sample. It's the ideal target for an analytical method because this target is chemical imaging, that is material information represented visually. And this was highlighted at the experts meeting um, last September in, in 2013. So going back to the toolbox, since we've ruled out the use of micro samples to obtain information on the pigments, we're left with imaging diagnostics and materials analysis. So I've listed three techniques for materials analysis, portable XRF spectroscopy, portable Raman, and portable FTIR. The last two aren't very suitable. Raman has a lot of problems with the environment, including overfluorescence from lighting, and FTIR only gives you organic information and information on some mineral pigments. Um, it also is a surface technique, so it won't work very well on, pig on paintings that are varnished. So we settle with portable XRF spectroscopy. And it's a good technique because it's elemental in nature and it's complementary to the imaging diagnostics. So first, I'll try to represent some state-of-the-art uses of both imaging diagnostics and materials analysis with XRF. The first is pigment mapping by reflectance spectroscopy. Reflectance spectroscopy covers a large wave band in small steps, so you can get a curve representing the reflectance response of, of the pigment material. These curves are likely characteristic, like a fingerprint of which pigment. And so far, the most sophisticated system is at the National Gallery of Art, and it's been developed by John Delaney. What he represents here is the ability to understand and map the locations of different pigments based on a scan. And these scans translate to uh, effective pigment mapping. We can tell where is the cobalt blue in yellow. Instead, where is the natural ult ultramarine in purple? And see that there's been uh, some missing spots been refilled with a different pigment other than the original. Next, oh, it has some disadvantages, however. The equipment is very expensive. His setup is fixed in the laboratory, and it requires uh, an optical bench um, that's very sensitive and not able to be moved. It's time consuming. To collect all those points from fiber optic uh, setup requires several hours. And so it wouldn't work very well to apply it directly to the diagnostic exam. Because we want to be efficient, adaptable, and also low cost. So an, ad an adaptation of uh, reflectance spectroscopy is found in technical photography. It involves selecting larger wave bands over the electromagnetic spectrum 
that, fo that form characteristic images. And these images focus on different strata of the painting layer. The varnish, the UV focuses on the varnish, the surface layers, the visible on the pictorial film, and the infrared can penetrate down to the underdrawing. And these can all be captured with a, a off-the-shelf DSLR camera modified for full spectrum collection. Basically, just one filter needs to be removed over the sensor, and then these cameras are ready to take diagnostic images using technical photography. For the diagnostic exam, I've chosen four of these wave bands listed in order to narrow down the time commitment required and get the most information in the least amount of time. This method was also detailed by Antonino Cosentino in his paper, The Flowchart Method. He used technical photography to narrow down what pigments could be present. Since I've chosen just part of the bands, uh, we look to economize this technique. So the flowchart for yellow is represented here, but it shows that in the end, there are nine pigments that can't be distinguished, one group of three and one group of six. So we want to add another technique from the toolbox, portable XRF spectroscopy, to try and narrow down the group. What is XRF? Well, XRF uh, is a way that we can study the elemental composition of a material. It involves sending a low energy X-ray beam uh, onto the surface. You can do it without contacting the sample itself, which excites the inner shell electrons from, from the atom and causes them to, to be ejected and then a outer shell electron drops in and produces a fluorescence event. So here we see a spectrum, and basically fluorescence events are characterized by the energy of the ejected photon. And when they hit the detector, the energy is measured, causing different peaks to uh, appear based on how many times a photon was counted at that energy. Here the green peak in, in this case is copper, and so we know which elements are present based on the size of the peaks. A state-of-the-art application of XRF is in elemental mapping by scanning macro XRF. And this is done by a group in the University of Antwerp and TU Delft. And they've created a similar XY scanner and use an X-ray beam to, to use XRF to study ma the materials. Here you can see the gold gilding in the Christ child's head uh, in a very detailed way. The beam they're using is very small and they can do small area scans, but it's also time intensive. Here's an example where they're mapping a small area of, of a painting. Now, does elemental mapping translate to pigment mapping? Perhaps not. Some pigments have the same elements. For instance, azurite and malachite are blue and green pigments, but both are based on copper. And so copper signal doesn't necessarily indicate one or the other. Some of the downsides of scanning macro XRF are that it's expensive, it's time consuming, and there's a complicated processing algorithm to obtain the maps. It's working on beta phase software, and so it's very inaccessible as a technique to use on a large volume of paintings. Back to the uh, design criteria for the diagnostic exam. So instead, we picked portable XRF because it's a more accessible tool. Uh, it's, it's handheld, it, it can operate in the field on battery, and the data is acquired in mere seconds. Here we can also carry out point analysis. We don't need to do a full mapping since the imaging diagnostics take care of the spatial distribution of the pigments. So the components of the diagnostic exam are start with acquisition. Acquisition first is the full technical photography suite, including infrared, visible, uh, UV reflected, and infrared false color, which is a combination of both the infrared and visible images with the channels changed. The second is to map the points to be analyzed with XRF. This involves some reading of the differences observed in the different wave bands of the technical photography images. Then after each color response is chosen, 
you'll end up with about 15 to 20 points to map. And then we scan each point with XRF. Next is the processing. Any diagnostic exam requires some standardization procedures. So for imaging, we use the pigments checker and the X-Rite color checker card, along with um, the AIC PhD photo documentation target. This provides um, basically a, a metric for uh, evaluating grayscale and for uh, getting color calibration so that it doesn't matter what brand of camera we use, uh, we can calibrate the colors uh, based on different sensor responses. Uh, for XRF, uh, the processing method involves subtracting the background. So a scan is taken on an area devoid of pigment, but having the matrix of the materials that make up the support, or basically what the painting is on top of. Then a simple subtraction is done, so we can understand which elements are present only in the pigment and not in the background. Lastly is the interpretation. We stick with a flowchart method. So here is a flowchart just for XRF. First, the major elements are chosen, and then a secondary peak is identified. And these translate into separating a few of the pigments. But there's still many pigments that don't have a secondary peak or that aren't able to be determined because they're made of organic materials, which are undetectable by XRF. Here's the combined flow chart, including uh, technical photography and XRF. So as you can see, the uh, pigments are narrowed down and each one is distinguishable, except for a small group of three organic pigments. So we have improved upon the original result of nine pigments unidentifiable, all the way down to three. Similar thing happens for the white pigments. In the white pigments, there were a group of uh, three and two groups of three that weren't able to be identified just with the technical photography. Instead, with XRF, all are identifiable because each has characteristic peak. With the green pigments, even though all were identifiable uh, with the previous imaging only, adding the XRL XRF helps us to distinguish between different responses in the infrared false color. Purple, blue, and black perhaps are hard, to, hard colors to distinguish between, but with XRF elements, copper, iron, and potassium, we're able to discern these, these three pigments. Same with the blue pigments. It looks kind of confusing, but basically each can track to a characteristic element and imaging response, affording separation for all pigments except for two organic pigments. So the organics are hard to, di dis uh, hard to discriminate. Here, uh, same for the red pigments, we can determine more than was possible before, um, but two are left over, two lake pigments, matter and carmine lake. So afterwards, after the analysis, the interpretation, and the processing, uh, we go to data storage. In order for time monitoring to occur and see if there are any material changes or visual changes, we need to have a, a, f a place to store the data. And that's the digital clinical chart, where the data can live for time monitoring until the next checkup. So this feeds into our um, basically feedback loop, which involves data acquisition, curation, analysis, and then dissemination. So here's a comprehensive view of the diagnostic exam in the field. First is collection of the technical photography, then the planning and mapping of the XRF points, then we scan each point, process the data, interpret the data, and arrive at the results. So next I'm going to show uh, three examples where I was able to apply this exam in the field. The first was in the Hall of the 500 in Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, Italy. And this project was associated with the search for the Battle of Anghiari undertaken in 2011. So first of all, we're in a, a large hall and in front of the mural by Giorgio Vasari, the Battle of Marciano in Valdichiana. Here is a, a selection of points gathered by LIDAR 3D uh, documentation data. 
And the panel on the right has been colored in, um, and that's what we're going to focus on. And we had the opportunity to get up and close with this research scaffolding provided by National Geographic. So here's, a, sh here's a, a picture of the mural overall. And these boxes were uh, areas able to be accessed using the scaffold. As you can see, it's just a small fraction of the surface of the entire mural. But we were looking to understand the artist palette. Here's one diagnostic image taken of the, the, um, the horse in the center figure. Technical photography was taken over this area using visible light, infrared reflectography, UV light, and pseudocolor infrared. So that's the first step, imaging diagnostics. Next, the XRF point analysis was carried out in the same points that were studied in 2007. And pretty much we discovered that earth-based pigments were used. But in one case, there was a, a restored area that included the use of zinc white, seen here. So we were able to characterize areas of original execution from areas of restoration using the diagnostic exam and determine the artist's palette of pigments. And it was consistent with the Buonfresco technique known to be used by Vasari. The next study was the adoration of the Magi drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. It's held at the Uffizi Gallery. And here, first imaging was undertaken and then it was looked to understood what is the ink used by Leonardo? It was primarily based on it was primarily based on iron and copper, and that way it could be identified as iron gall ink. Uh, areas appearing different in the imaging were analyzed with XRF for and, and according to the calcium peak, it was discovered that was likely a calcite wash procedure done in the, the 19th century restoration. Then also lead white highlights were discovered on the edge of each step. Okay, the last field scenario was, was undertaken in Sicily where over s 15 days six cities were visited and seven projects were undertaken. I'll talk about just a few of them here. This was made possible by a very portable suite of equipment. The imaging setup fit into two suitcases and a backpack and just one suitcase for XRF. So we could take everything in a small car. This research was published as the cover article in Archaeomatica magazine in 2014. First I'll talk about the Crucifix Chapel of Aci Sant'Antonio. Here, newly discovered frescoes were found in 2012 uh, when there was an uh, intervention on, on a leaking roof in the chapel. Basically, the chapel used to be a square, but later it was, uh, was renovated into an octagonal shape, and these frescoes were found preserved in the corners. Here you can see me taking XRF spectra inside one of the window niches. So the XRF spectra revealed many different elemental compositions and about 15 points were analyzed on each fresco. Here we can see there are a few different pigments, emerald green, chrome yellow, earth-based pigments like green earth, and then calcite, gypsum, vermilion, and lead white. So here we were able to analyze points on the, the Kiss of Jude fresco. And in the top portion, we can find green earth and vermilion. And these correspond to the expected date of the original, around this, the, 18th, the beginning of 18th century, ac according to the historical documentation and the study of the fresco. Whereas on the bottom, we find two more modern pigments, emerald green and chrome green from beginning of the 19th century. And these are modern pigments, also incompatible with fresco technique. So we know they must have been applied with a binder. So this information is very crucial when these, these frescoes will be restored. Because they had a problem with the, the ceiling leakage, they will have to likely take some interventive approach to make sure that these frescoes are stabilized and well conserved for viewers to see. 
In addition, they're choosing to leave the window sections open for visitors to the church. So in three different scenarios, the diagnostic exam feedback loop was field tested. It's proven to be non-invasive, user-friendly, and provides meaningful data in the end. It's efficient, repeatable, adaptable, and it relies on accessible equipment, which is considered to be low cost. Next, the research here at Cal-AT2, Qualcomm Institute, and CHISA-3 worked on improving the exam by creating advanced tools for exam implementation. How can we improve the user experience? Well, the first way is to add robotics. So we adapted an XYZ scanner from a 3D printer to serve as an imager. Here you can see the camera mounted by way of a 3D printed mount, which is scanning, rastering, zigzagging over the painting, and being able to capture the diagnostic imaging um, in an automated way. So basically, we can just press go, and the camera will work itself and come out with a mosaic tile data set, which provides high resolution photography. It also is a way to serve for reliable positioning of the camera. When we're imaging in multiple bands with UV and also IR, we can return to the same spot reliably to get perfectly overlapping images. So this was tested as part of the Hearing Landscapes project uh, performance undertaken um, in collaboration with, um, with the, the artist in residence, Leilong. So we focused on imaging the watercolors by a uh, Chinese artist, Huang Binhong, and then used the wave or wide angle visualization environment to display them in a large, in a, in a large, um, a large screen uh, for, for viewing. And here we can see minute details of the high resolution images. The red box is one TV screen, basically 48 inch. And so here we're seeing really large representations of the imaging. The next way we can improve the user experience is uh, through the development of a tablet application using augmented reality. It's called Artifact. It helps with visual visualization of data sets and the contextualization of the data uh, within the, the painting and also the uh, spectroscopic techniques. And it helps retain important metadata. So first of all, multiple images can be loaded up and the inbuilt camera to the app can be used to interact with the artwork if it's present. If it's not, the app can be stabilized and we can use the wipe off mode to visualize in between the different layers from the UV to the IR and the visible in between. This project was working on documenting a panel from a Sicilian wooden cart built in the 1920s. These painted panels were characteristic, char characteristic of Sicilian traditional folklore. The map of XRF points used to have to be painstakingly plotted, trying to correspond exactly to the area studied, and then showing a small picture of that area uh, along with the spectra in order to understand, is it a light blue, is it dark blue? Here are four, three blue areas represented with their corresponding spectra. And all of this data lives in a different home, needs to be manually co-located. Instead with artifact, we can use the see-through camera to visualize the artifact and uh, a map of points uh, where, where the XRF spectra were taken automatically appears in the exact location where each spectra was taken. Then you can click on a point and the spectrum pops up. And this allows for easy co-location of data and better visualization. So here's an organiz organizational flowchart of the analytical methodology. A better feedback loop is created between repeating the analysis later in time since the app makes it easy to go back to the same point. So lastly, I created two case, case study tests to understand the performance of the exam methodology. Was there any capability to discern between mixtures? Where are the detection limits? How does it cope with layered pigments? And are there any checks we can include in order to prevent the, the identification of a false pigment? So let's focus on the case of an oil painting. 
Oil paintings include complex mixtures of usually mineral pigments uh, suspended in a binding network, which is organic. They include many layers, from five to almost 40. They're made of mixtures and inhomogeneous materials. The schematic shows what a painting should look like, but instead on the bottom are three very different samples, including layers with large granules, small granules, um, really unflat and, and wavy uh, pigments layered on top of each other with potentially varnish layers in between. And they're very small. And so we want to understand in these thin layers, how can we make sure we identify all the pigments present? Here's another example of a sample under the scanning electron microscope, showing just the diversity of these complex materials and how thin a layer can get. So for the first case study, a painting that we'll call the Pratt Madonna was chosen as an ideal case because it's a mock-up painting painted with several different historic pigments, but also with retouchings and use of different pigments for the same color. For instance, there are three blue pigments, four green pigments, two red pigments, and two white pigments chosen for this painting. So we carried out the technical photography. A is the visible, B is the UV uh, reflected, C is the IR, and D is the false color IR. And this painting was also studied by Antonino Cosentino using a selection of 12 wave bands. And he was able to uh, segment the painting based on the spectral response. How about if we use just some modalities of the technical photography? For instance, in the IR, if you look at the flesh tone of the baby, it appears basically very bright. Instead, if you are trying to detect a red pigment present and you say, okay, it's really bright in the IR, you won't detect the use of red ochre because red ochre should appear dark in that stage of the flowchart. But if you include the XRF response to include iron, then it becomes apparent that red ochre is the only red pigment containing a large amount of iron. And therefore, the, the potential, uh, the potential uh, false identification or lack of identification with imaging only can be rectified by the use of XRF. The second case study was to evaluate uh, layering scenarios. Since in the Madonna, just one pigment was used for each area, uh, now we want to understand what if pigments are layered on, on top of each other. Are we able to understand which is the pigment below, which is the pigment above, and do, those, do the responses affect one another? Well, it's true, if there's a transparency in one region of the spectrum on the uppermost layer, that we'll see the layer on the bottom instead. But usually, with four different modalities, three can outweigh one, or two can tie, and then XRF can be used to determine the final pigment assignment. So these experiments worked out pretty well. The same was the case in three different ground layers. Here, the plate is divided into thirds, and one third is a ground layer with lead white, then titanium white, then zinc white. And while some of them turn very dark in the UV reflected, the other imaging bands are able to make up for a response that may become confusing to discern grayscales. So in a sense, the data feedback uh, loop works. We're able to use two techniques in order to distinguish most of the historical pigments included on the pigments checker. And then we have a full, um, full 360 uh, process where we go from acquisition to curation to analysis and dissemination and we're buffered by the fact that the digital clinical chart can hold all the data. So in conclusion, my contribution to the field has been designing a methodology for a true diagnostic exam. It's non-invasive. It's a non-invasive way to characterize the artist palette of pigments. It uses flow charts to narrow down the results based on exam data, and it follows the design criteria for ease of adoption and accessibility. 
It has the ability to gather meaningful data in an adaptable way and work on many different typologies of painted artifacts, from wall frescoes to manuscripts to oil paintings. And I've evaluated the performance and cataloged the limitations. It's always important to know what you don't know. The broader impacts of this diagnostic exam are that it forms a data-driven approach to preventative conservation by using non-invasive non identification. It's low cost, efficient, and adaptable. It creates comparable data sets that are reliable. And it, it merges the visual and materials data in a practical way. So hopefully, uh, conservation scientists can start to look like the group you see below, carrying their clinical charts and updating the state of health of the artifacts over time. The future work for this research are to include opportunities to integrate with a data, an automated data processing pipeline that would follow the structure of the exam using the flowcharts. This can also become a pathway to pigment mapping. To get over the time constraint of mapping every single point, we can instead use a signal processing approach that segments the painting before the data are considered and, and create a better pigment map of uh, works of art. Um, this can also use robotics to improve on user experience and, and make things run more smoothly to analyze lots of paintings over time. So I'd like to reiterate that I've been able to publish this in many different places where the research can be available uh, for more details. So during my graduate career, I've had the chance to present at many conferences and discuss with my peers uh, how this research can impact the field and collaborate on what other people are doing for preventative conservation. And I've been able to give a few invited talks around the world, including teaching to future art history scholars um, the techniques of scientific analysis for art documentation. So thank you for your time and your attention to my presentation. Thanks.